think everybody is here. Uh, we'll start a little bit early because I know there are going to be a lot of questions at the end of this, um, and I'll give you a five minute countdown when we get close. Okay. So I've, kept it, it. I've kept it a little bit shorter intentionally because I figured it. Awesome. So, hi, I'm Doug. This is my friend Kevin Dees. I'm glad that I can call Kevin my friend. And Kevin and I have spoken at several word camps together over the years. Um, Kevin is the CEO of a company called RoboJuice, and they do really cool stuff building websites for people. Kevin also happens to have been building a card game. I'll let you ask him about that. He's, he's been building it for a long time, so he has a cool prototype, uh, and that's something that's interesting to me. So Kevin's going to talk about Gutenberg blocks, and uh, I think you will find this very interesting. So, Thank you, Doug. And thank you, everybody, for coming to this talk. I hope that the time that you give me is a worthy investment for you and you get something out of it of value. Um, as Doug said, my name's Kevin. Um, I've been doing WordPress stuff for a little while now, probably since uh, the early 2000s, maybe. I guess 2010, you know, 2007, 2006. And so I've learned a lot along the way. And I've seen WordPress kind of grow and evolve over time. I remember the introduction of custom post types. Uh, that was quite a day, mainly because what you expected custom post types to do, they didn't really do that well at first. Um, but WordPress has come a long way since then. Um, and so, Hopefully, as we take this journey into where WordPress is today, we can reflect on the past and really history in general as, as far as publication goes and really take a look at why WordPress has introduced this thing called Gutenberg. And that reason really comes from this stemming problem in the WordPress ecosystem that a lot of really good developers and really smart minds have addressed through different features, uh, advanced custom fields, building their fields plugins um, for the lack of like an API and WordPress for that kind of thing. But also these page builders, right, like Beaver Builder and Elementor and others, maybe Divi, um, there's just so many of those that exist. And so why are these things being created? What problem exists that WordPress is trying to address in these other systems? are also trying to address. And that problem is this, right? When you're building a WordPress site and you're kind of new to things and somebody's built your site using older techniques, um, you kind of experience this. This is what you, you see in your mind. You're like, okay, I'm not touching anything. And if I touch it, it will crash and, you know, it might not be so fun for everybody. If you remember back in the day before custom post types had solved this problem, you did a lot of this. We still kind of do a lot of this, where it's just a page template for everything. And then there's these instructions, right? You have these instructions that say, if you want a portfolio, you have to go to your blog post, you have to tag them with portfolio tag. That way I can use the query system to pull in all your stuff so you have this unique page. Because I didn't have post types at the time. Does anybody remember those days where you would have to go and do that? This is very early on. But even still today, we still have this problem. And I think this is mainly what WordPress is trying to solve, is the problem of we look at the web in, in context of pages, like full-on pages. And each page, if it has something unique about it, we have to make a new template. And so every time we want to build something, two columns, three columns, we have to take that Gutenberg, I don't know, I can't really use it, that, that example yet, but uh, basically we, we want to produce like these, every page is like this different thing, but we can't really take the bits out of those pages that we can use in other places. And so we're essentially not reusing our code like we should be. And the interesting thing here is we've already solved this problem in code. If you code at all, you know what this is about. This is about looking for patterns. What things are being reused here, the person's name. And then what happens if I want to change the person's name? I have to update it twice, right? So we introduced this thing called variables. And now, hey, if I want to, uh, Johannes, uh, 
Johannes Gutenberg, and I want to use his name in place of mine, I can drop it in now. But up to this point, WordPress really hasn't done this very well when it comes to user experience. And that's what Gutenberg is trying to do. It's trying to take these little bits of things so we can reuse them, much like we do with this. And what would you do without variables? Right? So I don't think there's anything to be upset about when it comes to Gutenberg. It's, it's actually a very good thing. It's a very good thing for user experience. It's a very good leap forward for WordPress. And while there's a lot of debate on good, bad decision, the right way, the wrong way, the right thing is really that they're making a decision here. They have to move forward. We have to move forward as a community and embrace the way that the web is today. And this brings us to some history, right? So what is it about this Johannes uh, Gutenberg guy that, that made him so special, right? Uh, and I think we're going to learn a lot from this, because this is where we are today, and this is how we're going to embrace what's happening. In his time, a lot of people were handwriting all the texts for these manuscripts and books, and it... You'd be lucky if you got your hand on one of those things because it was either written by like a monk who just spent all of his time writing everything down in great detail. And there was a lot of craftsmanship, a lot of artisanship in that process. And so that was very revered as an industry thing. And you had this thing called movable type that had been taking place in, you know, Asia and those parts for quite a while, but nobody had really taken those ideas to the place that Gutenberg had. If you don't know what movable type is, essentially, before Gutenberg really kind of brought this to the forefront of the industry, you would essentially write your letters on a piece of paper, and then you would lay them flat down on a piece of wood, and you would cut out your letters as a mirror image, that way, when you would stamp something out, it would come out the opposite way. So put it on opposite, so when you stamp it out, it comes out the right way. It's kind of, you know, mirroring things. And the way they would do it is they would take the entire document, pretty much, and they would just put it all in this wooden slab, and you'd have a full page handcrafted each one. What movable type does is it says, let's take the components, like variables, that are the same, and let's reuse them. And so you basically just line up all these little items here. And then you can create lines and paragraphs and pages from these unique things. And you don't have to cut out your piece of wood every time. And that's really uh, a concept that Gutenberg didn't really invent, but it had been around for a while. What he did was he combined it with the printing press. And he combined this idea of putting these letters together and then putting those letters into a machine that you would basically crank on and this, this big, uh, basically wine press type thing would come down and it would press into the paper and get the ink on. You'd lift up and you'd have this really nice sheet of paper. And um, so he's using these individual components, right, to, to build these pages and now he can print hundreds of pages and build books and now you can have things like libraries for books because we have enough to share with people and make them more accessible. There's a lot more about Gutenberg that's interesting, but I think that's what pertains to us today. Here we have the old-fashioned way of I'm going to take a big page and I'm going to you know, do that one page and then now when it's time to make a new one, I've got to go do each thing individually all over again. And you'll see it here, but more modern today, you'll see with like advanced custom fields where Okay, check this box if you want this toolbar to appear on the page. And if this select menu is done, then I'm going to have a conditional statement that's going to give me another meta box because then you're telling me the page is going to be different. And so we have all these configurations that dash for that we saw earlier to try to get around this, but we really haven't solved the true problem. And that's what Gutenberg is after. And, and we've seen this with... Uh, design in, in general with the web, which is good. I think mobile has really moved us into that category because you have these thinner displays. We need better ways to display content, whether we want complex layouts or not. And, you know, you have uh, pages like this one that uh, you would expect to see on a mobile device, and more desktop, because people are doing mobile first nowadays, 
Like you don't have sidebars. You know, you're used to the sidebar kind of layout. So what you end up having is like with this page, you have different blocks, different sections of the page that you could reproduce and put different types of content into it. And so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at building out these blocks with Gutenberg and how it uses them. So uh, with that being said, everybody ready? All right, so the first step, you have to install a plugin first. WordPress has made it to where you can just go to their WordPress plugin repository, go on there, download the plugin, install it, and you should be good to go. So what does Gutenberg look like? If you haven't installed it, what is it? Well, Gutenberg basically makes it easy to go in, if you've used Medium or something like that, it makes it easy to kind of go in and start adding different components to your page. And so it does change the writing experience. You're no longer using that Microsoft Word-esque editor. Uh, every, everybody's basically based everything on Microsoft Word up to a few years ago, really. And so you can go through and you can add different blocks and things to pages. So here I'm adding a quote. Before I added a headline, there was an image up before. And it's not, I'm not pulling those things into an editor. I'm creating blocks of uh, things. And so even in Gutenberg, I have two separate blocks here. Those two are obviously separate. But it kind of knows that both of those are paragraphs. So as I back out, it combines those two blocks into one. So now I have a one paragraph. So it's, it's smart about how it does things. The writing experience is actually fairly good if you're doing fairly simple uh, configurations. If you get into two column layouts, that kind of stuff, some more advanced stuff might uh, feel a little bit different, but that's ultimately what Gutenberg does. Now, the question then is, how are blocks stored? How is all this data stored? So, it still uses the, w, or the, the post content section, but mainly it goes into these comments. Who's aware of like it doing this? Who is this new to? who's, who's uh, new to the idea that this stuff gets stored in the comments. So that's how um, Gutenberg is going to store your stuff. But basically, and the nice part about this is because there are comments, if you turn Gutenberg off, you still have all your content in your site. So that's very intentional doing it that way. They're also trying to maintain some level of backwards compatibility. But essentially, it's sort of these like uh, codified comments. And um, if you were to do some more advanced configuration, let's say we wanted to control this block here, you'll see that they give you this background opacity control here. And they're also going to store those kind of meta, that meta information inside the comments as well. And you can do this for some blocks, some blocks you can't. Okay. So now, as you can see here, we have this dimension ratio 60 over here. Um, which is basically that JSON code is the configuration for that block. And if you were to go and edit this code within there, you're going to get this like, hey, you modified this, you might have broken something. So in that regard, you don't really want to go into the code and edit things at this point, and they may address that. Obviously, Gutenberg's not quite ready, which we can get to those sorts of questions at the end. But Essentially, Gutenberg is going to store everything inside of that old editor database section. <clears throat> so let's look at coding a block. Real quick. Uh, so here I'm going to create a basic block, and you'll see that I've recently used that. So the blocks that you've used recently will go into that bucket. And if I click on the Gutenberg basic block, it has it there. It says "Hello World," and we'll look at making this in a second. I can remove it. And then you also note that uh, if you click on something underneath, you also have like a block available in that shortcut section. I haven't really figured out when that gets triggered, if it's a recent thing or not, but essentially you can get it there. And uh, so that's the block we're going to build. We're going to build this Hello World block. Okay. So PHP, what's the PHP stuff? How many PHP developers in here? Okay. It's going to be easy. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a constant. That way I can access my directory because I need to be able to load some JavaScript for Gutenberg. Gutenberg's pretty much written in JavaScript strictly and CSS using React. 
Okay. So I'm going to use this hook, uh, which is a Q block editor assets. And the editor assets part is what's important here because this is the assets for the editor on the back end. Okay. So this would be where I load my JavaScript and my CSS for the Gutenberg editor on the back end. And then what script am I going to load up? Well, I'm going to load up one called block.js. You can call this whatever you want. And I'm going to give it a handle if you're familiar with handles in, uh, in QE scripts. It basically gives you a unique name for your script so you can reference it later. And that reference can be used in what's called dependencies. So this gb-block basic is my handle that I can tell this uh, other scripts that this specific block.js file is required for that other script to work. Does that make sense? Everybody, anybody who's confused by that statement? No hands? Okay, good. Um, so then down here is my dependency list, which is the WordPress handles. Okay, and it's basically saying in order for me to, before I load this block one, I want to make sure that WordPress blocks JavaScript is loaded. I want to make sure that I have my translation stuff loaded. That's what that is. That's just for multilingual. And depending on your users and what you're building, you do and don't have to use that. Um, it's pretty easy to use, so there's no reason not to, but, you know, budgets and timelines. And then you have these WP elements uh, handle, which is going to load in some more JavaScript. So we need those three, really, to make a Gutenberg block. And that's it. Then we can get into uh, adding that into our hook here, which is pretty simple. I think most of us know how to do that. And then we get right into the JavaScript. So this is where things get a little interesting. Um, and basically, you've got to know a little bit of React at this point. And since this is not a React talk, I'm just going to focus on showing you the brevity and how quickly you can make these blocks. I'm not going to necessarily get into the fine-grained details of every little piece of blocks. I'm going to essentially be walking us through how to code a block and get it into the page, and then a very, very basic version of how to make a block editable. And then once you have that information, I feel like that'll uh, remove some of the stress or confusion that you might have around how these things work. So that's the goal here. But the first thing we have to do, like with anything in WordPress, is you have to register things. You know, you have to register a post type, got to register all kinds of things, taxonomies, and so uh, Gutenberg blocks are no different. They're going to work with that similar pattern, so it doesn't feel like you have to learn something new every time. However, instead of in PHP, it's in JavaScript. And so the way we load that up is through the WP global object. So how many people have accessed that WP global object up there to do anything? If you make like a custom image uploader, or you've accessed the whole backbone stuff that WordPress has, that's where you're going to go. And so all I'm doing here is I'm accessing that register block type method from the WordPress global state. That way I can call it down here. Okay, so I'm creating that variable so I can use it as a function. And then as part of the registration process, you're going to do what you've always done. You're going to have to prefix or namespace your block. That way, if I created this block called basic, and then Doug, who's introduced me, introduces his own block and his plugin, and it's also called basic, we're going to collide, and now it's a race condition. Who gets there first, right? Who gets there first wins it if they don't collide with each other completely and just break things? Um, so, uh, Essentially, what we want to do is we want to make space, and the way we do that is by adding our prefix to the beginning with a, a forward slash, or is that a backslash? I think it's a forward slash. And so, in this example, I just prefixed it with GB, but it doesn't have to be GB. It can be your initials, or the company, or the theme, or the plugins, kind of acronym, whatever you want to use there. And then that's going to translate later, which we'll see into our thing, but that's how you kind of name it. Then the next bit here is what we care about. If you remember in the admin we had it said GB basic was our block name. We clicked it and it added hello world. It also had that shield icon on it. And it was under the category of common. So if we look at that, 
Uh, what you'll see here is that under this blocks section, I have a shield. It's called GD Basic, and it's underneath the Commons section. And there are a lot of other sections. There are basically common formatting, layout widgets, and embed. And each one of those sections, you get to control where your kind of block shows up. And that's not how you're going to organize them into the menu. And those are your categories. Then you have the list of dash icons that come with WordPress. So WordPress really has a lot of icons that you can use to access. And those are going to be available on the WordPress site. Really, you can just look up dash icons. The ones that you probably want to get to use are the miscellaneous icons. Uh, they're typically toward the bottom down here. And you can see kind of the shield icon that I selected. And then what you'll have to do is you won't use the dash dot dash icons dash, you'll just use that kind of shield all section there. And that's what's going to be the, the code that you use for your icon in the JavaScript. And that, then you've got all these icons available to you. Obviously, you can get fancy with your CSS if you want and, and hack things. There's no reason you can't use your own code in whatever way you want. There's no reason you can't use vanilla JavaScript to do whatever you want. Just those are the APIs that WordPress provides to make the experience easier. And then we get into, uh, once we have all that, so that's pretty simple, that's like registering the post type, not too hard. But once we get into that, we need to know like, how do we actually get that element that pops up on the screen to show up there, specifically on the back end and the front end. And so for the back end, there's this property called edit, and that's going to require a function. And note here that I'm only referencing the functions, I'm not calling the functions. Okay, so that's something that I do quite often is I'll mean to reference something, but I'll actually call it. So I, I'm, whenever you call it, you put the uh, double parentheses at the end, and that calls the function. We don't want to do that. We just want to reference it. And for the back end and the front end, I can use the same code for this basic block because I don't want it to be editable. I just want to put that like paragraph tag on the page and put hello world in there. And so here's all the code that I need React-wise to load up that basic block into Gooper. And here, within probably about 23 lines of code, I already have everything I need to make my first Gooper block. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible. I like that a lot. And uh, basically, if you're familiar with React, then this should feel very familiar to you. But ultimately, if you're not, you just create, you get this create element object or method or whatever you want to call it. And you simply pass in some parameters and I'm going to say I want a pcag, which is what this is here. This class name, prox class name. Uh, I, I can tell you where that gets pulled from later. But essentially, it's going to be a, um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you later. And then there's the text that goes inside the, the element. Okay. So again, like I said, you're going to have to know some React to start really building these. Um, and so this, uh, the section where it says class name colon props class name. What does that do? Well, that's going to add the class name to our paragraph tag. And basically, it's just going to take that gd forward slash basic. It's going to remove the forward slash, replace it with a dash, and then append WordPress dash block at the end. And what we'll end up with whenever we click that uh, gd basic Gutenberg block in the admin is this is what will end up inside of our uh, code. So it's a very simple block. It just creates a paragraph tag. We can't do anything with it, but it says hello world. Um, and that's really that. So then we have CSS. And the CSS bits go underneath where we included our script. So just the back end CSS here. We're going to do a basic adding of CSS. We're going to require that the blocks CSS has already been loaded. And then we just drop that in line with the rest of the stuff. So pretty easy PHP wise. And that's that's really all the PHP we're ever really going to use for the back end. Um, so then let's style our hello world instead of just being plain old text. Let's, let's put some styles on there and see what happens. So I'm going to take that class name I had earlier on the P tag, put some styles on it, misty rose, a red you know, border, and that's how I get that. So when it comes to the front end, it's a similar process. This time our hook is a little bit different. Instead of editor assets, 
It's just a Q block assets. And that's going to drop it in for the front end. That's where we're going to be able to override the front end. I think you will find if you use this and you don't check for is admin within it, you'll actually get this same code on the back end as well. So you can end up with, if you only wanted to do this through CSS for now, that would work. But I, I would encourage you just use this for the front end stuff. Um, and then, you know, we're just going to drop in some front end CSS into that section. And then the same thing applies. Whatever the markup was in Gutenberg on the back end is going to be the exact same markup on the front end. So when we look at that in our design, on the front end, I'm just using the 2017 theme, I believe. And I've styled it yellow for the front end instead. And so that's what shows up. It's just the, the block there. Um, but that doesn't really do much interesting. That's just our hello world example. What about making these editable blocks, right? How can I be able to type into this? So if I want a block that uh, maybe is a Twitter call out, for example, right? Like that would be pretty more, that would be a little bit more interesting. So how do I make it to where I can type some text in there and then and do more interesting things? Um, so if we look at this, I'm going to show you an editable block here. If I go to blocks, the icons changed a little bit, and now it's a blue box, but instead of the world, I can now go and type inside of that block. So certainly this has to be like a lot more complicated, right? Um, well, it's not too much more complicated when it comes to the JavaScript. We just need to add a few extra elements here. And the first one of those is this attributes property. And we're going to access this thing called WP block source children, and we're going to say that as a variable. You can obviously access that directly for right here. That's where we're trying to access it. And we're just going to essentially say, hey, we want to look for the contents out of our children paragraph tags for our block. Um, and then we're going to update our edit and save methods to be this, instead of GD underscore basic, we're going to have some new methods. And, and because the back end is going to be editable, but the front end is not going to be editable. We're going to need different methods. We can't just share that same function between those two properties. So for the edit bit, really only a few things uh, change here. Okay, This isn't too much more code. However, we're going to load this editable uh, block component, and we're going to use that as our element instead of the paragraph tag. Okay. So now that I have that, then I can declare what my tag name is. I can call it a p tag. Or if you wanted to do like a, a link to a hashtag on Twitter or something, you know, you could make it an a tag, right? So you can, you can start to play with the components here that React would give you. So we're changing our, our placement of some things, and then we're adding a little bit more functionality here. So we're saying, whenever the content changes, whenever I'm typing in that box and that changes, what do I need to do? Well. I need to tell my attributes that I had created earlier that there's some new content, and I want to save that content to that area. And then uh, this other stuff here isn't so important as to, it should simply map kind of to those places, the, the, the attributes property, and then just some other little, little notations there. But that would essentially give us what we need. And then on the, the basic save section, which is for our front end, we don't really have to do a lot more here. Um, we can simply just make sure that we're grabbing the content that we created earlier in those attributes. So that way we can, instead of hello world right here, we want to grab the content from our, our attributes that was in the registration process. And we just want to dump that out right here on the front end inside of a PTAC. And then we have our class name here if we wanted that. And then for the CSS, we, uh, we do the same thing, except we change the registration name here. Instead of gb slash basic, it's dash edit. And then our class name would have changed. So now I can apply different styles to this editable content. And then I have this variable here that we kind of represent the output that you would get. And then you change some things, and you add a different color style to it. And then on the front end, but I don't want to change the front end looking. So I'll just change the actual class name on that CSS. And that is how you would end up making an editable block in WordPress Gutenberg.
Now there's some valuable links here. I, I don't want to go into much more detail about Gutenberg blocks because uh, mainly you really have to have some knowledge of React here and I can't really cover the full scope of all those things. But I do have resources for you if you really want to dig into um, how this works more. And I'm going to field all your questions, as many as you need to answer after this. But there, there are some really good links here that you can take down. And I'll, I'll also provide these links in slides, which I'll publish earlier. I'll give you plenty of time, and I'll leave these up. Um, but basically, there's this really nice boilerplate Gutenberg piece that I took a lot of the code for the example today from. So you can kind of go in there, and it shows you how to make that basic block. It shows you how to essentially create the editable block. It shows you how to create a block that would be like that tweet link. And it has plenty of comments and really great resources in there. And that's free, which is it's just a great resource, and that's going to continue to be updated over time. And then you have the plugin for Gutenberg itself, plugin slash Gutenberg. And then you have these, these other two courses that go into way more depth. They're also kind of, you know, you have to pay for them. I don't actually know if I'm allowed to uh, uh, mention these. But I think these are really good places. If you really want to get into Gutenberg blocks, you're going to have to take some steps to learn some new things. When Matt Wollenwood said, learn JavaScript deeply, he really was speaking to the future of WordPress. Because while we're accustomed to building most things in PHP, in WordPress these days, that is changing. Especially as the REST API continues to grow, more and more WordPress development is going to be geared toward that REST API, which you will interact with with JavaScript. So knowing these tools, especially React, because that's what WordPress has decided to use for a lot of their things, um, it's going to be good to learn. Now, uh, React for Beginners is excellent. Very, very good. Highly recommended. Wes Boss does that if you're familiar with him. And then uh, you have Gutenberg.course, where you can take what you've learned from React and start implementing more things, like uh, basically that customization piece where we change the opacity of the image. You get, you're going to have a whole lot more there that you can dive in with. So um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, hopefully this this dipped your toes into um, what WordPress is trying to do with Gutenberg. Um, <coughs> and I'll open it up to questions and any kind of um, questions about, you know, is Gutenberg actually going to happen, that kind of stuff. But whatever we want to talk about now, I open up the floor to you.